Flower Festival is a regular feature of St Eldon's Day events, so look out again for it next year. In the meantime, we're about to see another much-loved feature of St Aldham's Day, which is a talk from local historian Tony McAlevey. And you won't be disappointed by this year's theme. Here's Tony with, Was Elmer wearing any underpants when he flew from the Abbey Tower? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And today I'm going to attempt to answer the question, was Elmar wearing underpants when he flew from the Abbey Tower? Now, you might think that's a completely a ridiculous question, and you'd be right. It's very silly. Uh, however, I hope in trying to answer the question, I'll be able to tell you one or two things about being a monk in the Middle Ages that you didn't know about and give you a little bit more context about who this man Elmer was. Now, if you want to, if you want to visualize what Elmer might have looked like, I strongly recommend you check out the Explore Malmesbury interactive software, because that's got some great Elmer content, a very nice little animation of his flight, and an extract from a short film from which this is a, a still that shows uh, Elmer preparing for his flight and undertaking his 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 flight uh, and I think this is rather excellent. So I'm going to use this image to represent Elma in the rest of my talk and as I've said the key question is did Elma wear underpants? So how are we going to go about answering the question? Well what do the sources tell us? What do we actually know about Elma and do any of the key sources describe his clothes? Now this is William of Malmesbury and he's very important because the story of Elmer's flight was first written down by William in about the year 1120. And I've looked at William's account over and over again, but I can find no clues as to Elmer's clothes. Now you'll be pleased to know, given the importance of the underwear question, that I, I wasn't deterred by the lack of clues in William's account and started to look elsewhere. And I thought, well, he's a monk and he's a Benedictine monk. That is to say, someone who followed the rule of St. Benedict. So I wonder, I wonder, what does the rule of St. Benedict say about the subject of underwear? Now, actually, I discovered that the rule of St. Benedict is really very precise on the subject of clothing. And Benedict says that each monk should have two sets of identical clothes so that one can be washed and the rule actually says each monk should have the following clothes a tunic a cowl an apron for work socks and shoes that's it it says nothing else so no mention of underwear so i read the rule of saint benedict and then later in the rule i found a very interesting passage Benedict said, monks who are sent on a journey shall receive underpants from the wardrobe, which they shall wash and hand back on their return. So this was a real breakthrough moment for me in terms of my research. Benedict was clearly saying here that you would only be issued with underpants under the special circumstances that you've got to leave the Abbey. So that seemed to settle it. Elmer's a Benedictine monk. Benedict says, no underpants, no underpants. But then I started fretting about that because Benedict's rule dates from very early, from about the year 516, and Elmer flew 500 years later. So I began to have nagging doubts. Maybe attitudes towards underwear had changed by Elmer's time. So my quest for the truth about Elmer's underpants then took me to the British Library, uh, where I came across a very interesting manuscript. Uh, it's called the Regularis Concordia, and it's a set of really detailed regulations, much more detailed than the rule of St. Benedict, that was followed in Malmesbury Abbey during the lifetime of Elmer and had been written down just a few years earlier in 975 and given the royal stamp of approval. It was on the front cover of the document. Uh, these guys and the chap in the center with the rather 
unlikely looking crown is King Edgar, who ruled England in the 960s and the 970s. And Edgar and the two other guys, St. Ethelwald and St. Dunstan, were very keen to regulate life in the top abbeys in England, including Malmesbury. So it sets out in minute detail what should happen in the life of a monk. And I thought, ah, maybe this will give me some clue as to the monk's clothes. Now, the detail regulations from about the year 975 are amazing, actually. It's a really interesting document and it sets out in really quite minute detail how the monks should spend uh, their days. And they're occupied for hours and hours in church with their prayers. Their lives are highly regulated. The rules even tell you when you are and are not allowed to go to the toilet. But sadly, they don't say anything about clothes. So once again, I thought perhaps I'd reached a dead end. Now, despite all these setbacks, you'll be pleased to hear that I persisted. The detailed set of regulations from about 975 were written in Latin, nothing in the document about underwear. But at the end of the rules, there was another document written at the same time, but this time in another language, in Old English or Anglo-Saxon. And it's a guide to the monastic sign language of the period. And the monks, when they were not in church, had to be silent. Uh, and they developed quite a sophisticated form of sign language in order to be able to communicate with each other uh, without using speech. And this is a guide to that, an extract from a guide uh, to, to the sign language that they used. And it was in, within this document that I made a really exciting discovery. Somewhat to my surprise, the sign language guide makes it clear that the monks had regular baths. And this section of the sign language guide relates to sign language when they are uh, bathing and after they've had a bath. And it's got all sorts of intriguing details, uh, including the sign language for please pass me the soap. Uh, and this section that you can see here comes just a little bit after it. And it's to do with getting dressed after you've had a bath. And can you see on the second line, there are two words in Old English. Now, oddly, the first word, the first letter is separated out from the rest of the word. There's a big B in red, but it actually belongs with the, the letters that come after it. And it says in Old English, it says brechina tanken, brechina tanken. So this was my eureka moment, because it turns out that the phrase brechina tanken in Old English means the sign for underpants. The idea was that when you were getting out of the, the bath and you needed somebody to pass you some underpants, that you would make a particular sign. And actually the gesture was to move your hands up your thighs as if you were pulling on your underpants. And that's what it says in this document. So it's pretty conclusive proof that the monks in Malmesbury Abbey at this time did wear underpants. So that's the end of my little investigation into this terribly important question. Elma, my conclusion is Elma did indeed wear underpants. And I rather like the fact that his dignity and modesty would have been preserved when he crash landed after his historic flight. Well, thanks for your patience. If you'd like to know anything more about my uh, researchers into Elma the Flying Monk. Uh, I am doing a longer talk about this topic uh, during the carnival, so it would be great to see you then. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Tony, for that fabulous presentation. It's certainly given me food for thought. I'm already looking forward to next year's St. Eldam's Day history talk. Now, if you've heard stories about tunnels under the town, and what they might have been used for, you will enjoy our final item. Alice Beer presents an investigation into some mysterious tunnels 
under some of Malmesbury's buildings. I'm Alice Beer and I've known and loved Malmesbury for many years. Well, we all love Malmesbury above ground and its beauty, but have you ever stopped to think about what might be beneath our feet? Today, I'm going to investigate the mystery of the Malmesbury tunnels. For generations, there have been stories of a network of tunnels running beneath Malmesbury. What they're for and whether they ever actually existed, no one seems to know. I'm starting my investigations at Malmesbury Abbey, where I'm hoping to learn the truth of the tunnels from local historian Charles Vernon. Charles, hello, lovely to meet you. So I'm on a quest to find out about these tunnels that supposedly run underneath Malmesbury and end up at the Abbey. Tell me, what do you know about them? Well, in 1891, Joe Moore, who was the owner of the old Bell Hotel, was searching underneath the hotel and found some passageways there. Of course, at the moment, the old Bell is being refurbished and it's not possible to get in there. But most of the underground uh, areas have now been bricked up and there's not a lot to see. I have Country Life here from uh, 1956. The journalist says, a man now over 80 told me how as a boy he was allowed to wander about in the tunnels beneath the Old Bell Inn where workmen were extending the wine cellars and the strange things he saw and heard that you wouldn't believe unless you'd seen them for yourself. Four great archways forming a dome, strange carvings in the vaulted roof, coffins, some with lids, some without, as well as skeletons and other objects scattered about the floors. This is so exciting. I believe that that is um, rather fanciful. It's possible that there were passageways. But what now? Where are they all now? You could go round to Abbey House. You might find something there. Just next door to the Abbey is Abbey House. It was first built in medieval times and was originally the lodgings of the abbot. I'm hoping that a building with this much history might have evidence of the tunnels. I'm here to meet the present owner, Rufus Pollard, to find out. Hello, hello, thank you. Rufus, thank you for letting me come here. I have been told to come here because I understand the Abbey House might be part of the missing link in my quest uh, to find the tunnels of Malmesbury, but it, tell me a little bit about the history of the house. Uh, well, the genesis of the building goes back to the 13th century, uh, formerly part of the Benedictine Monastery. Up here where we are now, this is the 16th century. It was built in sort of 1543, uh, it's the suggested time. <laughs> the house changed hands backwards and forwards over the centuries. The records get a little bit hazy. Um, and my family came here in 1994 after it had been abandoned by the Deaconess of St Andrews in 1991. So you moved into a house as a child that had been abandoned by nuns. There must be so many stories and, and mysteries. Is there any evidence that the tunnels of Malmesbury existed? Possibly. We can go take a look if you like. Let me lead. So this is the undercroft in here? Yeah, originally known as the Abbot's Hall. Okay. Watch out for the ghost. <laughs> oh, what? It's actually quite creepy. Wow. Oh gosh, it's beautiful, isn't it? That was definitely the fireplace down there, but it's very possible that this down here was a tunnel. Wow. Do you really think it's a tunnel? Have you tried digging it out? We would if we could. Uh, planning permission doesn't allow for that sort of thing. So you're not allowed to dig it out? We have a duty of care in here to preserve it as best we can, as it was. And what do you think? I, I think it could very well be a tunnel. The, the size and shape of it and in line with the doorway over there too. Um, it's hard to know what else it could be. Sadly, we'll never know. 
And where would it lead to if it is a tunnel? Uh, well, there's theories that everything would lead back to the Abbey as a central hub and they'd have catacombs underneath the town taking them to uh, buildings of significant interest around. And could this link with anywhere else in town? Well, it's in line with the Crosshays car park, so you could possibly try Crosshays house over there. With Rivers' tunnel pointing me in the right direction, I'm heading to Crosshays and a beautiful Georgian townhouse. Will Malmesbury's secret tunnels finally reveal themselves here? To find out, I'm meeting the house's owner, Justin Brown. I've kind of been on a bit of a treasure hunt around Malmesbury and I'm hoping that Crosshays house is the pot of gold at the end. Tell me a little bit about your beautiful house, Crosshays House. Well, it dates from the early Georgian era, 1728. It's stamped on the hopper at the side of the house. At least we know that's when the facade was built. It could well be older than that underneath, but the Georgian house dates from then. Justin, I've been told that there just might be something that looks like a tunnel or the beginnings of a tunnel underneath your house. Tell me, true? Well, we all have our own theories. Obviously, we would love them to be true. For one thing, King Athelstan, of all people, is, has a tomb in the Abbey, but we know that his bones aren't in it. So, of course, they might well be under the car park. That's where you find kings these days. <laughs> um, and whether or not there really was a tunnel is up for grabs, but we can at least have a look and see if we can see any evidence. This is the tradesman's entrance, is it? <laughs> I'm not insulted. That's right. Yes, I'm taking you through the tradesman's entrance. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't say it. Don't trip on that one. We call this part the catacombs, and the lovely lady we bought the house from, who did a lot of the renovations, she put this fabulous door here, which means that you don't even need to know about this if you don't want to. Now, if you see any, any rats, they're very friendly, just wave. Oh, my word. Gosh, I really wasn't expecting this. Oh, you really have? I think we found a tunnel. Wow. Well, I did warn you. Oh, my word. Now, it's, uh, it's uh, dark, dank, and mysterious, and it has the most wonderful stalactites. Well, Justin, I happen to have bought my trusty head torch. Would you mind if I just went and had a nosy? You are more than welcome. <laughs> no, no, you're not coming with me, are you? Yeah. Thank you so much. If I'm not back in a couple of hours, call for help, OK? I'll do it. Based on what Justin has told me, it could well be that behind these walls are the tunnels that I've been searching for. And they could possibly lead to the underneath of the Old Bell Hotel and those remains that the elderly gentleman described in the magazine article. If the tunnels are here though, there must be a reason that they've been sealed up. I'm beginning to think that I've done enough searching and some things are better left undisturbed. Well, that was an exciting look at what lies under our feet. Thank you again, Alice, the film crew, and everyone who welcomed the film crew into their homes. I think there's probably a lot more investigation to do into the tunnels under Malmesbury. So if you have a tunnel or evidence of a tunnel under your house or building, do get in touch with the Tourist Information Centre and share your story with us. That's all from us. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the programme and that you've had a good St Aldham's Day and a great bank holiday weekend. Take care and stay safe.